just, it's just the way that it works as we go through. Luke chapter 18, we're going to be in verses 31 through 34 uh, today. <clears throat> 31 through 34, that's what we'll read in just a moment here. It would be pretty weird and strange for a brand, an organization, a movement, um, a company to pride itself to boast about weakness, shame, and defeat. We never hear that. You don't, you don't go, uh, you know, to, to the store and see an ad up on the, on the wall for, you know, Nike shoes saying, you know, we're not as good as Adidas, um, and our shoes are going to break down when you, when you, you don't, you don't read that, right? You don't, you don't see a McDonald's ad that says, here, by the way, here's the legal document that proves that our 100% pure beef is not 100% pure beef. It's only 10%. So if you want to come, come have more cardboard than cow if you come to our, our, you don't see that, right? You, you just don't see it. Or SpaceX, which some of you hear about is one of the leading uh, space exploration kind of companies, movements today. You don't read like, oh, none of our rockets make it into orbit. None of our engineers are qualified. And you better just go to North Korea to figure out how to do space exploration. Or China or Russia, not us. You don't read it. In fact, I just randomly picked, no, no, that's true, by the way. Well, McDonald's, I'm not sure about that. But anyways, uh, I went on their websites, Nike, McDonald's, and SpaceX, just randomly, just to see what they actually say, to really, you know, to see if they, do they boast in their weaknesses and their shame and their defeat? I think the answer that we all know is absolutely not. Nike, when you click on their website, you see this new shoe right there, and it says, our most cushioned road running shoe gives you extraordinary comfort Supreme softness and lightweight support through every mile. Where's the weakness there? Where's the shame and the defeat? It's not there. It's saying, this is the best shoe you can have, and it will take you every mile. I went to McDonald's, clicked on the menu there, and went to the Big Mac. The first two words that describe the signature burger in McDonald's is, nothing compares. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know about that. Nothing compares, and it goes on to list the amazing ingredients of the Big Mac. I wanted SpaceX. Again, like I said, if you don't know about SpaceX, it's, it's uh, Elon Musk's kind of leading uh, a space exploration movement and, and uh, company. And when you go to their website, it says, building on the achievements of Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy, which are some of their rockets. Building on their achievements. SpaceX is working on a next generation of fully reusable launch vehicles that will be the most powerful ever built, capable of carrying humans to Mars and other destinations in the solar system. Where's the defeat in these? Where's the shame? Where's the glory of their weakness? It's not there. It's not the way that the world works. And yet, the central focus of the movement that started 2,000 years ago of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The central focus is the weak, shamed, and defeated Jesus of Nazareth, stripped bare, suffocating in agony on a man-made man -made tool of torture called a Roman cross. And then to sort of advertise, to market the movement, to follow this man, what, 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 what does the movement say to those interested? It says, come, worship that defeated man at the foot of the cross. Let his blood drip on your head and stain your clothes and you take up a cross as well as you daily sacrifice your wants and your needs to love and to serve that man. Welcome to discipleship, right? The gloriously gritty life of following that man who hung on a cross, humiliated. The whole Christian faith is totally upside down compared to the world. From the very beginning, the world has always been about glorifying themselves. You think about Babel in Genesis 11, and you know the phrase, let's build this tower to make a name for who? God? For ourselves. We've got to make a name for ourselves. Even Satan, before he was cast down to the earth, wanted to come above God, make a name for ourselves. While the Christian faith, the call of discipleship is, not glorying in yourself. The only thing you should glory in and boast in is your weakness. Glorify God in your weakness and in your dependence of Him. In a world right now, in a culture right now, of absolute self-worship, we as disciples must constantly be reminded, which we're going to be reminded today, that we follow Jesus, who never conquered 
via self-will, via pride, via arrogance, but through humility, weakness, and defeat, through a cross, a Roman cross. And Jesus' own disciples needed to be reminded of this at this point in the gospel story, and we need to constantly be reminded of this as well. So let me read uh, what Jesus, what Luke describes here in uh, Luke 18, verses 31 through 34, and listen carefully what Jesus says. So he says this, And taking the twelve, that's Jesus taking the twelve, he said to them, See, behold, look, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. But they, the twelve, understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. Fathers, we just heard your word. We know that your word is power. We know that your word lasts forever, is eternal. We know that your word is a sword that cuts us, um, that reproves us, that rebukes us, that corrects us, and that trains us. And we ask right now that your word spoken now would effectively do that good and glorious work in our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's quickly go over this text just so we understand it. In verse 31, we see that Jesus took the 12. So this is no longer a public event. He, said, he took the 12 privately. He has something to say to his 12 specifically, something that they need to hear. And he says, behold, which when we read that in the Bible, it's listen, right? Be, listen very carefully here. Behold, look, we are going up to Jerusalem. Now, ever since Luke chapter 9, verse 51, we've seen that Jesus has set his face to Jerusalem. He's determined to go there. And I've said many times why that is, and we're going to get there in a moment. But he's determined to go despite the dangers that await him there. Jerusalem was the center, in fact, still kind of is called the city of the world, you know. It is the center of worship. In fact, if you go to Jerusalem today, it's this crazy concoction. I remember sitting on the steps of the southern steps of outside the city um, with the, my old uh, job with Back to the Bible, doing a little tour there. And it was such a weird concept because here we are surrounded by Catholics, you're surrounded by Greek and Russian Orthodox. Here we are as evangelicals singing How Great Thou Art as we can hear on the loudspeakers the Muslim call to prayer. Like what a concoction of all these various things going on. And I forgot to mention obviously the, the Orthodox Jews as well, uh, right there as well. I can't forget that. It's crazy, right? When they were going there, they knew that going to Jerusalem was not good because the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees, the scribes, the, the priests, this is where they held power. This is where the temple was, where you met with God. And they were going to Jerusalem, and they knew. The disciples knew the dangers that came to them there. In fact, there's a, there's a section in, in the Gospel of John where Jesus tells his disciples, we're going to go towards Jerusalem. And Thomas almost kind of sarcastically looks at his disciples and or looks at the other, his fellow disciples and says, all right, well, let's just go and die with him then. Let's go. Because he just knows, like, if we go to Jerusalem, it's not going to be good because everyone is not liking Jesus right now. Well, I shouldn't say everyone. The religious leaders and the Pharisees who Jesus has been supposedly kind of, you know, stepping on, um, they don't like him and they've been trying to conspire against him to kill him. Even in Luke 4, we saw when Jesus is in Nazareth in the synagogue there and he, he, he tells them that he is the, the anointed one by uh, prophesying from Isaiah chapter 60 saying, I am, the Spirit has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to bring recovery of sight to the blind and so on and so forth. Do you remember what happens to them? They take him and they try to huck him off a cliff because it's blasphemy uh, in their understanding there. We are going up to Jerusalem. That is what uh, Jesus tells his disciples. And the disciples would have knew the dangers that came. And then he says this, everything, this is in verse 31, he says, everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. Now, when Jesus says the Son of Man, he is referring to the Old Testament understanding of this Son of Man, which there were various ideas. In Psalm 8, for example, the Son of Man was just reference to a human being. 
But in Daniel chapter 7, we see that the Son of Man was the prophecy of this heavenly figure, like a Son of Man, who inherits the kingdom of God in a very powerful, triumphant way. And Jesus uses, he loved to use the reference Son of Man to refer to himself in the third person as a way to sort of hint, in a very obvious way, that he encapsulates all the Old Testament said about the Son of Man. Yes, he is a human, absolutely. But he's also that, Daniel 7, uh, heavenly heavenly figure. So he is the Son of Man, and it says that everything, he says everything written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. Now the prophets, when he says the prophets, he's, he's thinking about the whole Old Testament canon. And the whole Old Testament canon, all the prophets from Moses, who's called a prophet, to Samuel, to obviously Isaiah, Jeremiah, all of these prophets, all of them spoke in various ways by inspiration of the Holy Spirit of what would come of this Messiah, of this Son of Man, of this Anointed One, the Son of the Most High God. All of them spoke about, in kind of prophetic ways, prophetic references, what was to come of this One to come. And all of them have been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. There's one Messianic Jew, his name is David Stern, he's written this thick book that I love, uh, called the New Jerusalem Commentary on the New Testament. It's a Messianic Jewish perspective of the whole Old Testament, which is very fascinating. And he, obviously being a Jew, goes through and he finds all of these prophetic references in the Old Testament that Jesus' life and ministry exactly um, fulfills. And there's at least 20 of them, obviously even more uh, than that. For example, in Psalm chapter 50, verse 6, which relates to our passage, we have the psalmist uh, who is referenced to even Jesus the Messiah, saying, I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. Well, if any of us are familiar with the story of the passion of Jesus in his moments before his trial, all of this happened to Jesus. Stricken, spat on, mocked, mistreated. We see that right there and we already heard it in our passage. And I want you to note something here in this verse, in verse 31. Jesus says, everything written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. Everything. There were prophetic references in the Old Testament about the Messiah's glory and exaltation. Quote, unquote, the good, the good pr- prophecies, the good ones. But what Jesus says here is that all of them, Everything written by the Son of Man will come to pass, not just the good ones. I think about Psalm 110, verse 1, where David says, but obviously this reference to Jesus, the Lord said to my Lord, so to Jesus, the Messiah, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. I mean, that's an awesome prophecy. Sitting at the right hand of the Father with enemies as a footstool for your feet. Jesus would be like, yes. But he said everything. He would have also known A prophecy from Psalm 118, verse 22, that he, the Messiah, would be the stone that the builders rejected. He would be the one, though the Messiah, his own people, the religious leaders and Pharisees, would reject him and say no. Everything that is prophesied about Christ will come to pass. And in verse 32, 33, we see, Jesus now explaining. So everything's going to come to pass from what the prophets said about the Son of Man, me, for, he says in verse 32, he will be delivered to the Gentiles. And this is a way to say, I'm going to be handed over to the Romans. I'm going to be handed over. I'm going to be mocked. I'm going to be shamefully treated. I'm going to be spit upon, flogged, and killed all in fulfillment of the prophecies from the past. And then he says, on the third day, I'm going to be raised. Now, listen, this is important. Six verbs there emphasize his defeat unto death. Delivered over, mocked, shamefully treated, spit upon, flogged, and killed. One verb explains his victory unto life, to be raised. Now, this does not mean from this one passage that his suffering is greater than his victory, obviously. But in this specific passage, when he calls the twelve together towards him, as they prepare to go to Jerusalem, he is making a strong point here. And he is specifically emphasizing his suffering. And you can see it clearly. He gives one verb to his victory 
all the rest, the details of his suffering unto death. So we can understand that this is important for his disciples to grasp. It's important for us to grasp this very day. In verse 34, though, we read this, but, this is after he says all of it, but they understood nothing. They didn't grasp it. Their idea of the Messiah that they grew up thinking about was to be, and we've talked about this a lot, the conquering king. The one that's going to establish the kingdom. They think back to those like King David, who in King David's reign, and even King Solomon's reign for a time, there was great victory, physical victory. In Solomon's reign, the boundaries of Israel were grown to a place that they had never been to before. There was great accomplishment. And then we know the prophecy that Nathan gives to David, saying one of your own descendants is going to be on your throne, and he's going to have a forever kingdom on your, uh, forever reign on your throne. So obviously in their minds, they've grown up with this anticipation of a king that would be like David, that would conquer in the same way that David conquered, through blood. David was a man of blood. Even though he was a man of poetry and beauty, he was a man of blood. And they thought this next Messiah was going to be like this, conquer. So get those Romans out of here, kick them away, Squish them, crush them, let us set up a new Zion. And may Israel be the the kingdom that it once was and even better. So you can imagine the disciples then, their thoughts just kind of so confused as they hear their Messiah, Jesus, and they knew that he was the Messiah. Back in Luke 9, Jesus asked them straight up, who do you say that I am? I know what everyone else says about me, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, speaking for all of them, says, you are the Christ of God. Christ is the Greek term of the anointed one, the Messiah. You are the Messiah. They knew it. So you can imagine them, just their brains, just like flabbergasted at this reality of their Messiah going into detail of just constantly saying, I'm going to be delivered over to the Gentiles, to the Romans, to the enemy, mistreated, flogged, spit upon, and killed made zero sense. But then we also read this. These things were hidden from them. God sovereignly played a role in this. Now, I understand there's mystery there, for sure. But listen, not only the disciples, but the Jewish nation as a whole, not specifically the priests and the Pharisees, but just the regular Jews in the time, okay, The desires of the Jews, they imposed their beliefs about the Messiah onto Jesus and they wanted him to act and reign as they thought that he ought to. Right? There's even a a passage in, I believe it's John, when after seeing him do these miracles, it says the Jews tried to take him and make him by force into the king. Right? So there's this, there's this theological uh, phrase called the messianic secret throughout all of the Gospels. Now it sounds very, it's not like that. It's not like it's the secret, the code you have to figure out. What, it, what, what, what the messianic secret is, is this. If you read through the Gospels, you're going to see these strange things where Jesus will go and raise a young 12-year-old girl from the dead. And then he'll tell his parents, don't tell anyone. You're like, what what do you mean, Jesus? Like, tell everyone. Don't tell anyone. And the thought is that Jesus knew that if this just spread like wildfire, then he would be forced, in a sense, to become something that he is not. And he knew what he had to do. He had to go to Jerusalem and die. And his own disciples and the Jews, they would say, no, 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 you are the Messiah. We're going to protect you. I mean, think about Peter. When Jesus is about to be betrayed by Judas Iscariot, and what happens? In his zeal... Peter takes his sword and cuts off Malchus' ear. Because in his reference, the Messiah, we've got to protect him. He's to be the king and conquer. We can't let him be betrayed into the the priests and and obviously be handed over to the Romans. It would make no sense. Peter, again, we're just picking on Peter for a moment here. We would have all done the same. But in another time when, when Jesus tells them very plainly that he's going to Jerusalem and he is going to die. Remember what Peter says. Peter's like, no way, Jesus. We're, we're going to make sure that doesn't happen to you. But Jesus, knowing the truth about the real Messiah, the real Son of Man, looks at Jesus or looks at Peter and says, you know, get behind me, Satan. Don't, don't thwart me. Don't tempt me. I know that's what you want, but that's not what's actually to come. I'm to go to Jerusalem. You even have, as well, just one more example. You have two disciples, unnamed disciples, on the road to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24. We'll get there eventually, Carrie, maybe in a few years. 
Luke 24. And they're on their way after their Messiah had died on the cross. And, and Jesus, in this amazing story, go read Luke 24, it's amazing. Jesus comes up, you can imagine him with a hood on, and, he, and they don't recognize who he is. And Jesus is like, hey guys, what's going on? Why are you guys so dismal? You know? and, and they go on and they talk about what's happened, and then they say this, we had hoped that this man, who we thought that was Messiah, we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. We had hoped. But our hope is lost because he's dead on a Roman cross. You see, the disciples did not grasp what Jesus was saying at all. It didn't make sense. It did not conceive and, and, and click in their minds. And God played a role in that, perhaps in that whole messianic secret way, uh, to keep it hidden until the moment that it was to be on full display. So that's our passage. But here's the questions I want to ask as we look at this passage in full. Why did Jesus determine to go to Jerusalem and face his suffering unto death. Why? Why was he so determined? Thanks, Luann. Why was Jesus so determined to go to Jerusalem? And then after that, we, we understand that question and answer that question. I want to ask this. What does this say about our discipleship? What does this say to us as his disciples whom Jesus says, hey, we are going to Jerusalem? Notice that? Not, I'm just going to go. You guys hang out there. I got something to do. He says, we are going to Jerusalem. What does it say to us as we follow him? So let's ask these questions. First question, what, why did Jesus determine to go? Jesus was determined to go to Jerusalem. Let's just, let's just get that first. We've seen that in Luke so far. Luke 9.51 set his face. I already said that. He was determined to go there even though he knew he was to suffer and he was to die. Jesus knew what the prophecies said about him, and he knew that they were all to be accomplished through his obedience, his humility, his obedience unto death. That's what it says in Philippians 2, that he was obedient to the point of death. He knew that it would come about by his obedience and God's providential will of ensuring and making sure that every single prophecy would come to pass as it is written. He knew this. And I believe he even knew this as a 12-year-old boy as he was in the temple talking with the, the leaders, and they were astonished at the amount of knowledge that he knew. And his parents they thought that he was with them as they were going back to Nazareth. They come back and say, Jesus, what are you doing? And Jesus says, I'm supposed to be here. This is my father's house. Already at the age of 12, Jesus as a boy knew this is my father. He understood the special, unique relationship that he had with the father. And at this point, if you can imagine these leaders of the temple being astonished at the amount of knowledge that Jesus knew at the age of 12, then you better believe that Jesus already at 12 knew of those dismal prophecies about his future. At 12 years old, that he would have to be scorned and mocked and spit upon and hated even at the age of 12. He knew this. He knew this. But why did Jesus die? Why couldn't God, as God, allow God's king, his anointed one, his Messiah, just kind of squish the enemy and set up his kingdom for us? I believe we have to recognize this question before we look back and ask, why was he so determined? We have to ask, why did he even die? One verse that we need to go to that is, I mean, we could go to many, but this one just is very prudent, is 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. This is what it says. Christ, Jesus, suffered and died once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh. I'm going to read that again. Listen carefully. Jesus Christ suffered. He died once for sins. The righteous for the unrighteous so that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh. Jesus suffered in Jerusalem and was put to bodily death on a Roman cross for sin. For sin. Now sin... It's humanity's rebellion against God. It's lawlessness, as John says. Sin is lawlessness. Sin has separated us from God, our maker, and has subjected to us his holy wrath. There's no getting around that. This first Peter verse that we just read even shows us that sin has made us unrighteous, the righteous for the unrighteous, 
and has separated us from God because the verse says that Jesus died for sin so that we might be brought to God. So there's a separation that occurs because of sin and this nature of unrighteousness that comes about because of our sin. So Christ, who in this verse is described as the righteous one, the righteous for the unrighteous, he died for sin. So who sins? Well, obviously we know that it's not his, but ours. And one of the most important words, theologically speaking, of the gospel that we must remember is the word substitution. The core of the gospel is this reality of substitution. His death was a substitution. And this verse in 1 Peter 3, 18, so clearly shows it. Jesus Christ suffered for our sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. His cross was our cross. God could not and cannot to this day receive unto himself any human being who is unrighteous because of sin. Cannot. And because of God's love for us, he made a way to make the unrighteous Isaac and the unrighteous Mike and the unrighteous Richard and the unrighteous Carrie, he made a way to make the unrighteous righteous. And the only way that that could ever happen was if the righteous one, God's only son, died as a sinless sacrifice in our place. Only way. There's no just kind of squishing the enemy and just inviting us into his kingdom. Couldn't have happened that way. There had to be the substitutionary sacrifice of the sinless son of God. Jesus knew this. He knew that to go to Jerusalem and die would be the Capital T, capital H, capital E. The demonstration of his Father's love to the world. He knew it. In fact, in 1 John 4, 9 and 10, we see this is God's love for us. That he sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. To be the wrath-bearing sacrifice for our sins. Jesus knew this. He knew it. John Stott, some of you maybe heard the name, he was a 20th century pastor, theologian, author in England, a very prolific, beautiful writer. Um, Read whatever he writes. It's very good. John Stott says that there was a particular section in the Old Testament that Jesus must have learned the most from in his preparation for his responsibility as the Messiah, uh, who was to suffer and die for human sin. And you guys know the section, or some of you do, and it's the section of the suffering servant in Isaiah 52 and 53. And I'm going to read, um, I'm going to read it in full, because I want you to hear this. Don't, don't read yourself, just listen to, to, as I read it. As I read it, just shut your eyes and imagine with me Jesus himself, starting from when he's 12, all the way up until his passion. Imagine Jesus reading this in the prophets. Imagine him meditating and reflecting on what he was to do. Because this is about him. So listen to this. Jesus would have read this. See, my servant will prosper. He will be highly exalted. But many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, one, could, one would scarcely know he was a man. And he will startle many nations. Kings will stand speechless in his presence. For they will see what they had not been told, and they will understand what they had not heard about. Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance. Remember, this is Jesus understanding who he is as the Messiah. Nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected. A man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness that he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God. A punishment for his own sins, but he was pierced for our rebellion. Crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own sin, right? Yet the Lord 
laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream at the age of 33, 34, 35. But he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong. He had never deceived anyone. But he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous. For he will bear all their sins. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. Imagine knowing this, reading that, meditating, reflecting, praying through that, and still determining to go to Jerusalem. Now, could you say that he was determined because he wanted to just obey his father and fulfill the prophecies? Of course, that's true. But, listen, his obedience to the father was never separated from his love for you and for me. Ever. Once. To prove that, you have Paul himself saying in Galatians 2.20 that Jesus loved me and he gave himself for me. He doesn't say Jesus gave himself because just to obey the father and I just had to go do it. Duty. You don't hear him say that. Jesus loved me and gave himself for me. Ephesians 5, 2, Christ loved us, gave himself up for us. Went to Jerusalem for us. Scorned, spat on, afflicted for us. Titus 2, 14, Jesus Christ gave himself for us to redeem us, right? See, Jesus determined to go to Jerusalem and suffer the crushing of his life under his own father's wrath for our sin. Why? Because he obeyed his father and fully shared in his father's love for you and for me. Fully shared. The thought of his own people delivering him over to cruel Romans didn't deter him. The thought of him, the divine son of God, being mocked by his own people didn't deter him. The thought of being shamefully treated didn't cause him to retaliate in vengeance. The thought of being flogged, having a whip with pieces of bone and metal attached to it, striking his bare back over and over and over again until his own muscles and bones are protruding and exposed, it didn't make him miss one step towards Jerusalem. The thought of him suffocating publicly in front of his own mother and followers didn't stop him from going to Jerusalem. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he's in deep distress and anguish with his capillaries bursting and blood dripping with his sweat, when he prayed to his father about another way to bring salvation, if there would be any other way that would prevent him from drinking the cup of his own father's wrath reserved for the unholy nations, any other way that would prevent his father from crushing him and forsaking him. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me, he says. If there be any other way that would prevent him from becoming sin, who is sinless. Even then, in the garden, on his knees, with his own disciples, not even able to pray with him to support him, but falling asleep. Even then, he resolutely said twice, not my will, but your will be done, Father. So why did Jesus determine to go to Jerusalem and face his suffering unto death? It all comes down to love. His love for his Father and his love for you and for me. It's all about love. And wonderfully, as Jesus himself knew and even mentions in our passage, even though he would suffer immensely, what does it say? On the third day, he will rise. He will be raised. He knew the prophecy like we just read about in Psalm 53, that there would be a victory and many descendants would come to him after. 
and we're including those. We're included in that. He knew the prophecy of, for example, Psalm 1610. You will not abandon my soul to Sheol. You won't abandon me there, but you will, you will not let your Holy One see corruption. You're not going to let that happen. He knew that what followed the agony was glory. He knew that what followed the torture was triumph. He knew that what followed the vitriol and the violence was victory and vindication for him. He knew it. He knew it. Now, what does this passage say about our discipleship? In verse 31, just go there again. When Jesus first begins, he says, See, we are going. And for whatever reason, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that is what struck me this week as I was preparing. We are going to Jerusalem. It's not just Jesus. This isn't just Jesus' road. This is real discipleship. If, if we truly believe that we are disciples of Jesus, a disciple does not sit back and watch. A disciple does. A disciple learns from and imitates their rabbi. So, hey, Students, we are going to Jerusalem. Isaac, come. We are going for suffering. We are going. For us disciples, the cross is not only our glory, it is also our garment. It is not just our glory in that we get to have victory through Christ's death, and we do. Praise the Lord. Romans 6, we're buried with him into death and rise again with him. Praise God. But until the day comes when he returns, we also wear our cross as a garment. As Jesus so clearly said in Luke 9, 23, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Take up your own cross. Jesus wants to make clear to his disciples, that's including you and me here today, that we walk the same road that he did unto glory, towards glory. Though his cross secured for you and for me our glory, Amen? We bear our cross until that glory is finally and fully here at the return of Jesus. Now, what does it mean to bear, bear our own cross? I'm going to just uh, quote from John Stott again. He says, Our cross is not an irritable husband or a cantankerous wife. I had to look up that word, cantankerous. Irritable, annoying. We use that, right? Oh, I just got to bear this cross. Got to go to, you know, whatever. We use it that way, but John Stott rightfully says no. What a, what a terrible way to use that phrase of bearing your own cross. That's not what it means. What it is, is instead the symbol of death to the self. He goes on to say that our, being, our bearing our cross is a death to self as we put to death the old nature and its evil desires. And it's also death to safety. It is a being given over to death for Jesus' sake. I promise this last quote that I'll say of, of Stott, but he paints this great picture that I just found so fascinating. There is, um, I'll quote it in a second, but you have to remember that at the moment of Jesus' crucifixion, Pilate came out and said, okay, the tradition is I have to release someone for you here. You can release Barabbas, the insurrectionist, the murderer, or I can release to you Jesus. And what do the people say? Crucify Jesus. Let Barabbas go. Barabbas went free. And then as Jesus takes his cross and is going to Calvary, he couldn't bear it. So they grabbed Simon of Cyrene to carry the cross of Christ to Calvary. With those two characters in mind, Barabbas, who got out free, and Simon of Cyrene, to carry the cross, John Stott paints this amazing picture. He says, every Christian is both a Simon of Cyrene and a Barabbas. Like Barabbas, we escape the cross, for Christ died in our place. And like Simon of Cyrene, we carry the cross for he calls us to take it up and follow him. Isn't that beautiful? Now, like Jesus, we know that we will rise with him on the last day. Amen. And we also know, if my brother Ted was here, he'd say, make sure you say this, and I'm going to say it. We also know that even now, we have his resurrection life in us. We do. Even now. And yet, as this specific passage has emphasized, I believe that for whatever reason, Jesus today wants to remind us of the cross of the cross, of the agony and the suffering of the cross of Christ, realizing that it's this very emblem of shame, of weakness, and of defeat that is our glory. It is our power. It is our honor in Christ Jesus, the cross of Christ.
So, brothers and sisters, without Christ crucified, we are without hope. But with Christ crucified, we have everything. See, the world looks at the cross and it scoffs. It scoffs. They can't conceive of it. They mock it. Frederick Nietzsche is like, no way, the cross is stupid. He didn't use that language, but basically that's what he says. Even the beloved Gandhi in India could not fathom a kind of cross figure who would die in some sort of miraculous virtue for the redemption of mankind. It's ridiculous. The world looks at the cross and it scoffs. But for those of us whom Jesus has called, follow me. What is the cross for us? The cross is the power of God. It is the wisdom of God. And it is the love of God displayed for us. So, church, here's our application today. Let us boast in his cross every single day. Praising him for his wisdom, praising him for his power, and praising him for his love for us in the world. And along with boasting in his cross, let us carry our own cross every single day, putting to death, crucifying the deeds of the flesh, the wants in the flesh, of the flesh. And let us rejoice in our persecutions and our tribulations for his sake as we await the final glory. For some of us, it might look like being pinned to a real cross, like Peter and like many others in history. Or it might look like living 80, 90, 100 years daily dying to yourself and being an image to others of self-denial for the sake of Jesus Christ and him alone. We're going to pray, and then we are going to respond 